do, do you have any uh, any generalized advice you could give to the just the everyday person on how to manage that relationship with technology? So, so my personal experience with this is that um, it seems like this age is kind of it's one of the characteristics where people feel bombarded, and there's almost uh, there's a bunch of good. Um, books on like the attention economy and how all of these companies are competing for the 24 hours that you have in your day, whether that's through video games or Netflix or social media or something else. Uh, and then that seems to be against a backdrop of people seem to be a little bit more isolated where there's less community uh, in the country or in, in the world, um, less religion, all of that kind of stuff. So it seems pretty normal now to look at your screen time on your just your phone and see maybe three, four hours. I would assume the average is somewhere probably around there, uh, not including everything people are doing with their computers. Um, and I know that on some level, basically everyone I know complains about this or feels like they don't have the grasp on, uh, a grasp on their relationship with technology that they'd like, but they don't know what to do about it. Do you have any, do you have any thoughts on the application of Zen or anything you've learned to dealing with this particular problem? Well, um, yeah, I think, um, you know, it's, it's, it's interesting. I gave a whole talk about this at the Austin Zen Center back in um, 2019 in January. Um, you can still find it on their website. Um, and, um, you know, I think that you, you have to look at technology as a relationship and any relationship that you have, whether it be with family members or at work or a romantic relationship, if you don't pay attention to what's happening in that relationship and you don't set appropriate boundaries, um, the relationship will just go off the rails. And um, a lot of, I, I think, um, times we underestimate the power and this, the gravity of what the tools that we're engaging with actually have in them. And um, I, I think that um, I tell people to start off with an inventory, you know, and to look at um, what, what machines are they interacting with, you know, and to look at the applications um, in those machines and how they're, and, and just, just, to, just to kind of lay out the landscape of what, what are we talking about, you know. Um, I mean, I've got this pen here that is a part of my, you know, technology relationship. And it's one of these smart pens that, you know, if I put it on the screen of my iPad, or actually it's a, a Microsoft Surface Pro, you know, it'll, if I click, it'll do one thing and it'll do all, I mean, it, it, and this thing is like amazing. And I've got my, you know, my mobile phone and I've got this earpiece that I'm using from um, Logitech and it's amazing. All the little tiny buttons that go all along here and, you know, I can tell it to call people and it'll call people and it'll do different things to record conversations and it will do things for, I mean, it's, it's really quite um, interesting with um, what happens. And, um, you know, so taking that inventory, I've got, you know, my Alexa on my desk that has a camera and I've got three of them in my apartment that control the lights and the sound and the TV and all that sort of thing. And I walk in my kitchen and I say, you know, I ask it to um, play, you know, um, NPR news, and then I start making dinner. And then I forget, like, how long I'm supposed to actually boil Brussels sprouts. And I'll say, give me a recipe for Brussels sprouts, you know. Um, and so, you know, realizing the scope and to think through your day, all the different ways that you use technology and to do an inventory. And that's where you start, is your inventory. And then from there, um, start to think about, you know, the ways in which things are obtuse. For instance, one of the best things, uh, one of the more tangible things you can do is look at your mobile phone and to look at all the applications that you don't actually know how to use. Um, oftentimes, you know, you'll, you'll kind of know how to use an application and you can fumble your way through it, but most applications people know how to use less than 5%, you know. They just know how to, how to do just a little bit with it. And, um, you know, there's... Um, if, you can make a rule that if you're going to add something to your phone, you have to set aside, you know, 20 minutes to learn how to use it, you know, and to really know how to use it, you know. And um, we can get frustrated with just the inundation of um, all the different options. 
And so I, I usually um, tell people to hone like what it is that's actually on your phone that catches your eye with all the little tiny widgets. Those widgets, all those little icons on your phone are designed to grab your attention and make you want to click on them, you know. And um, to, to take off, you know, I, when I did it in my first inventory, I took off probably 60% of the applications off of my phone. You know, I realized that they really weren't that necessary. And then to start to learn how to use the ones that are there. Um, and then I think that um, thinking about whether or not there are, there are spaces where you just don't have technology, you know. Uh, I tell people to start with the bedroom, just experiment, you know. Never let your phone go into your bedroom, you know. And to see what it's like to actually, you can get a basic alarm clock, you know. Um, you don't have to get, you know, all the different, you know, um, things that the phone can do. Now, if you've, if you've honed things and you're really disciplined, then maybe bring your mobile phone into your room and let it be your, your alarm clock, you know? Um, but it's so tempting, even in the middle of the night, if you can't sleep, to just roll over and like, you know, well, I'm going to surf a little bit, or I'm going to look up this and such, or whatever, you know? And, and um, that can, it's a very, very powerful machine. And um, to have it right there next to your bed, um, not a good thing for most people. Not until you've really built a habit around, you know, how to have a relationship with your phone. Um, and then I think that, um, oh, and I also have a watch. I have a, uh, you know, an Apple watch that's connected to my phone. And, you know, um, how, what's my relationship with that? The first thing I did was I realized I don't know anything about an Apple watch and it kept like doing that, um, uh, what's that thing that does the haptics on my wrist? I kept feeling it like tell me stuff, you know, it kept telling me to do things. So the first thing I did with my watch is I made it stop telling me anything. You know, it couldn't even tell me I had an email. You know, I, I was like, it was like until I know how I want you to come to me, I'm just going to go to you. So at first, now my watch actually tells me to do a few things. But I mean, it was, it was a process because, you know, when you buy it, um, it, it's basically telling you stuff all the time. And uh, I'm like, no, you know, I, I don't, I don't need to know. Um, I've already got enough reminders. So, I mean, he was telling me to breathe, you know, it had a little breathe thing that comes up and it's just like, that's like an automatic insult. Tell me to breathe. And I was like, what? It, it was telling me to stand. It's like time to stand. And I'm like, I don't want you to tell me, to, you know? And, um, it, it, it really felt like I, I needed to have a, so I made it stop telling me anything. And now I actually let it tell me to stand because I realized that's a good thing. I, I like the stand thing. You know, I've been sitting at my desk too long. That's good. You know, I don't need it to tell me to breathe. I still don't let it tell me to breathe. Um, and, you know, there's, um, there, there's a lot of different things, but just I have a relationship with my watch now that works, you know, and I resisted getting the watch for at least three years. I thought about it off and on. And I was just like, no, nah, too much technology. I got to learn how to use the stuff I have right now. But once I had a good relationship with my phone, then I got, got the watch. And, um, you know, but I don't, I don't uh, still, um, it's, it's an ongoing, it's a, it's an ongoing relationship. I've not done the, um, the streaming services with music. Um, I still do music pretty much the old way. Um, I will tell um, any stuff that's free and I, and I want to hear it, I'll say, you know, Alexa, you know, play, uh, wait a second, Alexa's starting to listen to me now. I can't say that because it'll, it'll happen. But, um, you know, I'll, um, I'll, I'll, I'll tell um, it to, you know, play the latest song by Dua Lipa or whatever. And then, um, but in, in regard to my library collection, um, that can get infinite. It can just suck you into like building all these different playlists and all that, you know, I don't know that I, I, I have the time to really control that. So, um, you know, I just don't do it. And I don't have a subscription to Spotify or to anything like that yet. One day I probably will make the time, but until I know I have the time to set that up and to do it in a way that actually will work for me, um, I'm just not going to do it. Um, and so I think that, you know, those sorts of things have to happen. And then after you do your inventory and then you start setting your relationships, you set your relationship with each object and your relationship with each application. Um, then I think you have to figure out, um, when am I going to, um, have, have some downtime, some me time. So if you have a, let's say if I had a girlfriend or a wife, um, you know, um, 
everybody knows one of the best things you can do for your relationship is to spend a day or two a month apart at least, you know, where you just don't see each other. I mean, you can get sick of anybody as much as you like them. Um, and um, it's great to just get away from that person for 24, 48 hours and not, you know, be with them, you know. And the same thing goes for these relationships. I think it's great to, you know, for all the goals that my, my watch has for me to do, for all the steps I need to take each day, um, you know, I take it off and just only have it with me. I, I completely turn my phone off sometimes in a, for an entire Sunday, you know. Um, I'll let it ring like old school if somebody has an emergency, but other than that, every single bit of it is off, you know. Um, and no internet, you know, um, and, and, and to see what that does, you know, it's hard to even know what your relationship is with an object until you step away from it for a period of time, you know, and, um, you know, and, and the same thing goes for like a, uh, a, a romantic relationship, you know, you get away for a week, you know, on a, on a trip or whatever, and it, it resets something, you, you come back to the relationship and you see it a little bit differently. And so I try to um, sit for an entire day at least once a month. I try to do a one day sit where, you know, it starts on um, like Friday night at, you know, 730 and it goes until like Saturday night at like six or something. And um, I'll sit, you know, for maybe two hours on Friday night and then I'll sit most of the day on Saturday for in like 30 to 35 minute increments with five minutes of um, med walking meditation in between. Um, and maybe an hour for breakfast and an hour for lunch and no, um, no technology. And, um, you know, I, I think that those sort of things are really powerful to even understanding what your relationship is. Do you, do you think about, so and another part of this is you actually give talks to tech companies. I'm not sure if it's about this, but you do give, uh, talks to tech companies in and around this area, right? Zen applications to business. Oh, yeah. It's yeah. almost what, what I just gave you is probably ten minutes of a of an hour long talk that I give at tech companies. Yeah. So how did you start doing that? Was is that a more recent thing that you started doing, or and how often do you do that? Well, yeah, I, mean, I think that um, they started something here that you know you've attended before. It's at San Francisco Zen Center called Young Urban Zen, and um, you know a lot of people at Young Urban Zen are somewhere typically between ages you know twenty five and forty, but um, or maybe maybe like 22 and 40, but have um, um, you know kind of gotten out of college, gotten their first tech job, and kind of said to themselves, "Wait a second, you know, um, there's got to be more to to life," and um, are asking some bigger questions. And um, so there's a there's a lot of folks, of course, here with our demographic in Silicon Valley and San Francisco is tech heavy. And a lot of folks that attend Young Urban Zen, um, you know, are in that field. And um, I've connected with a lot of people in that um, group. In fact, um, I think every student I've worked with has pretty much um, come through that group at some point in time, as far as just, you know, people that relate to me and I relate to them. Um, and that's where a lot of those connections happened um, in regard to talking at tech companies, um, was people saying, you know, hey, you know, um, me and my coworkers, um, and you know, w can you come? And we, we do this thing every Friday afternoon. Um, I went to Thumbtack, for instance, and they have a um, a thing, or they had a thing. I don't know how they're doing during COVID, but they um, they had a thing where every Friday at three um, they would have a, a seminar um, from somebody in some field for free that would come in and do a presentation, you know, on whatever. Um, and um, so, yeah, I came in and talked to a whole bunch of folks. I did that at, um, at Stitch Fix. I did it at IDEO, um, just different places um, where you're, um, you know, talking. And it's, it's amazing. I'll go in and, and there'd be like, you know, 50 people sitting there that are engineers. And um, after we spend an hour together, the, like the head of HR will come up to me and go, I have never seen any time that we've got 50 people in this company together in a room, not looking at their phones, you know, but we set the, we set the, the bar just like at the very beginning. It's like, you know, if you want to look at your technology during this presentation, go outside, you know, 
And, um, and, and while you're in the room and you want to look at it, just notice what that feels like, you know. Um, but, um, yeah, I think there's, there's a hunger and a thirst. And I haven't had a lot of people in, in these presentations looking at their technology. There's a real desire to, um, to ask the question, how can I be with this job that seems impossible? and actually use some Zen principles. Are those things diametrically opposed or can I actually be um, a person, you know, neck deep in machine learning for 15 hours a day and still, you know, be using Zen principles? Is that possible? And the answer is definitely. But the, the ways to do it are not intuitive and they um, might seem counterproductive. Um, but I did have one person come back to me six months later and tell me that something that well, I was talking about the Pomodoro technique earlier. I told them, you know, this is um, someone who's basically doing um, um, programming all day long and, um, you know, time is always of the essence and how fast can you type and how fast can you logically work through the different scenarios and problems and, you know, come up, you know, and it's like, once you get a, once you get rolling, you know, you don't want to stop, you know, you want to keep the train of thought moving, you know, and I said, well, if you, if you did that for 25 minutes with a clear intention and then you stopped for five minutes and then came back to it, um, I think that it, it would still work even in your job. And he, he said, you know, it just, it, it seemed like I would lose my train of thought. And, um, but he tried it and, and found out that, you know, he said, I get less done over the course of an hour, but I get more done over the course of 16 hours. And um, I think that he noticed that um, he actually could keep working longer and his attention span, um, you know, in hour six and hour eight was way better than it was. Um, and memory was improved. And his eyesight, his eye strain was improved and, you know, all so many things just made it easier to actually do the job um, that was maybe difficult to see if you just did a one hour test, you know. Do you, do you, uh, and I know we've touched on this a little bit, but do you think about, so I guess what's unique about your position is you, uh, you're, you're an ordained Zen priest, but um, I'm sure, uh, probably most of the people, if not all of the folks that watch this will never have, um, you know, met or heard of a monk that has uh, three Alexas and um, worked in technology and has the devices and has a, has a good understanding of that. That to me, that that's always felt like a pretty unique thing. So do you, um, in addition to the talks, is there anything you're, do you, do you have any ideas about, potentially pushing that uh pushing more of this kind of stuff into the world i know i know we've talked about a few things including maybe executive coaching or uh, a podcast or different things but do you have any have you have any thoughts on potentially continuing this line of thought in different ways yeah well i will mention that um although it might not be as common in the last five to ten years, I think there's been more priests like me um, emerging. And, um, you know, I can think of others that I've trained that are living here at the Zen Center now that, um, you know, do a lot of very similar things. And, um, you know, Dan Zygmunt, I don't know if you've ever heard of him, but um, he's, um, you know, worked in very senior positions um, at Facebook and at Google. Um, and um, he's currently on the board of Zen Center, and he's an ordained priest um, who doesn't live here in residence, but um, still, I think, I think he still works at, at Facebook. Um, no, I think it's at Google. Anyway, I forget where, where he's at, but um, he wrote a book last year about um, Zen principles in um, the technology field. Um, you know, the original book was by Les Kay in the late 70s, who was an IBM executive. Um, who was a student of Suzuki Roshi's and um, founded the Canon Do Sangha, which is in Silicon Valley, um, and is still vibrant and thriving, and he's still running that Sangha. Um, and he never quit being an IBM executive for 30 years, um, and now is retired, and he wrote Zen at Work back in the late 70s. 
Um, and um, ZBA, written by Mark Lesser, um, Zen Business Administration. Hmm. Um, he and um, he, he was one of the co-founders of um, Search Inside Yourself, which initially started at Google. Um, and he went there as a Zen priest, basically teaching Zen principles, but not talking about Zen, just talking about the principles. So it's, it felt more like outside of religion. And it was it became the most famous or the most popular um, you know, extracurricular, I guess you'd say, um, seminar to attend at Google. And then um, he took that um, further than Google and founded this organization now that is worldwide called Search Inside Yourself. And it's essentially what they do is they go into tech corporations and they talk about using Zen principles in the um, workforce. Um, but they don't talk about Buddhism. They just talk about the principles. And then Mark left... Um, um, left search inside yourself and he founded another company now that's Mark Lesser Associates that does essentially that and it's executive coaching for people that are tech executives and uh, Mark Lesser is my personal coach um, and I work with him once a month so th this is emerging there are people out there that are starting to do it and um, you know I, I, I've considered doing a podcast myself and, and doing some other things in the future um, I feel like um, you know, I want to do it one step at a time because these things can be overwhelming and um, I would have to, you know, cut something out of my life in order to make time to do something like that. And right now I, my plate's pretty full, but I think that's the direction that a lot of things I'm working on are heading because there's just such a thirst for it. And um, I think that um, the that marriage between Zen principles and um, where people are living and working is just so relevant today.